Welcome, welcome, Erev Tov. We're going to try to uh, record these uh, meetings every time that we have them. As I announced in the, in the, in the group, Ezra Hashem, this will be a series. I intended to do four parts to the series, and I intended to do the first one last week. So it looks like it's going to be three, and we're going to try to do our best to fit in the material from last week into the session for this week, which is why there were an, there were an ungodly number of sources sent to the WhatsApp group. But we will do our best. Now, just to give, just to give a little bit of a premise as to what we're going to try to do over here. When the Torah gives over the narratives, really any narrative, but especially the narrative in the beginning of the Torah describing the progression of world history, it is giving over details that are necessary from the primary sense to be able to understand the progression of history. However, it is often, uh, and intentionally so, as we will probably see, leaving out vital context as to what exactly is going on. And indeed, the Jewish people, the progression of the Jewish people, and I include within that the generation of the forefathers, the generation of the others, uh, their influence is meant to be a universal influence. So... It, it, would be, it would be foolish to think that the interactions that the Avos had with individuals stayed at the level of individual interactions. Rather, it is clear that there was tremendous, uh, uh, we'd say, national, even geopolitical underpinnings to what is occurring in the Torah. And in order to be able to understand the progression of what is going on, it's important to be able to understand this context. And it also sheds light on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the spiritual revolution, and I chose those words carefully, the spiritual revolution that is taking place in the time of Avram, and what exactly he was facing, what exactly he was trying to do, and what he, exactly he accomplished. Uh, to start off, our, our, our starting point is not going to be from, uh, from, from, from Avram, but rather from the parasha before, from uh, Parshas Noach. Bezrat Hashem, at the end, we will go back even further to the beginning of Bereshus to be able to bring everything back to full circle. But in terms of the progression of the narrative, we will start from Noach. And Noach is an interesting character because Chazal even have a lot of ambiguity regarding Noach. As the Pasuk points out, you know, I had a, I had a conversation with, uh, with uh, Rav Dober Cohen, who uh, teaches over here at Eishat Torah, uh, on Shabbat, and he asked a good question, you know, why, is, why, did, why, are, why Chazal, exactly him, why, why, did, why did Chazal, uh, uh, you know, choose the, why was there even an option to, to, to judge Noah as only a tzaddik vis-a-vis his generation, that he was only righteous in his generation? Right? There's two opinions. One opinion says that he was a tzaddik, a complete tzaddik, and he was, you know, even, even compared to other righteous people, he was, he was, he was righteous. And the other opinion says, no, he was only Bedor Osav compared to his generation. But if he was in another generation, he wouldn't have been righteous. So the question is, why, why, why don't Chazal judge him favorably? You know, we're supposed to judge people favorably. If there's an option to, to, to interpret it nicely, so why don't you interpret it nicely? So the answer is, Pashat, Rabosai, the answer is that Dan is what, right, to judge someone favorably is in the context when you see something going on in the world. You observe something happening in front of you. And it seems that there's room for suspicion, but you, could, but you could also judge the person favorably. So it's a mitzvah to judge the person favorably, right? All things being equal. However, that's not what's going on. That's not what's going on at all. We're reading a book which was written by a prophet was dictated by God. And it, it, it's not there, a happenstance for us to observe. It's there in order to give you a lesson. The question is not, what, what is the meaning of this event that I'm observing? There is no event you're observing. You're reading the lesson that Anavi is telling you. So the question is, what is the lesson that's being given over? Is the lesson being given over that Noah was a completely righteous individual and therefore he was chosen to be the remnant of mankind? Or is it saying that Listen, there had to be a remnant of mankind, and Noah was the, you know, was the best of all the worst options. Some, something like that, right, to put it in an extreme version. And the answer, as we will see, is yes. The answer is that that ambiguity is intentional. That, that Noah embodies, while Noah is, in fact, a tzaddik, he's the only person, he's the only real person that the, that the, that the, that the, that the Kisve HaKodesh, the Tanakh, explicitly defines as a, as a, as a tzaddik. Avram doesn't get that title. Moshe doesn't get that title. David doesn't get that title. Even Yosef, who we typically in the in the classical literature is called Yosef Atzadik, doesn't call him that in Kisvei Hakodesh. He's called Atzadik, which is not a an empty title. But Tamim Hayab Bedorosav Bedorosav that there was something about Noah's righteousness. 
that was unique to that generation. There was something unique about that generation and that in another context it wouldn't have been sufficient or there was something lacking if it would have been in the context of another generation. In order to understand this, we have to go, in order to really understand the roots of this, we have to go all the way back to the first time Noach appears in the end of Parshas Bereshis. So Noach is born and his father Lemech uh, uh, declares upon him a very interesting thing, which we don't, we don't see really this, this type of declaration by any other person preceding him. And he says, so, so Lemech says, Ze yinachamenu, this one will console us. Mi itzvon yadenu, from the, from, the, from, the, from, the, from the torment and the sorrow of our hands. Me'adama asher erera Hashem, from the land that God cursed. So the question is, how did Noah console the earth from the land that God had cursed? Adam Arishon sinned, and as a result of that sin, there was a curse that was brought onto the world, on, onto, onto the earth, Adama, on the actual earth. The actual earth was cursed. That before the sin, things grew naturally in, in abundance. There was no, there was no, there was nothing, there was no investment necessary. And now you need to work, you need to toil, as it, as it says, uh, as it says in the curse of Adam. So how did Noah console the earth? So the Midrash Tanchuma says the following. This is Midrash Tanchuma on Bereshis, Simen Yud Aleph. Umau mima'aseinu mitzvon yodeinu, from the sorrow of the work of our hands. Kodam shenolad Noah, before Noah was born, lo kishahayu zorin hayu kotsrin. They would not reap what they sowed. They would sow wheat and they would reap thorns and thistles, as it says in the curse of Adam. That, that right? The world went back to its state of inhabitability. They were doing agricultural work with their hands. Imagine the plowing the earth with your hands, right? digging in the earth with your bare hands. Okay? Noach was the first inventor of farm tools. This is what was Noach's contribution. Noach's contribution was is that he was able to invent a solution. We think that these things are rudimentary now. From our perspective, you know, if you don't have a tractor that's plowing the, you know, 20 acres in, uh, in a half an hour, that's already, that you're already behind the curve. But back then, compared to what people were doing before, this was a huge leap forward. The fact that people now had tools with which they could work the ground. And indeed, this is the root of Noah's righteousness. Noah's righteousness is the righteousness of the person who looks into the world and sees a problem and he fervently, fervently wants to find a solution to this problem. He sees people are suffering. He sees people are, are even dying. People are dying of starvation. In Noah's generation, mass dying from starvation was like it was, was, was an actual possibility. And Noah sees this. He comes into the world, and he sees that, there's, that there's, this is a real issue. And so he puts his mind to it, and he looks to see what's possible to, to fix. And this is what he comes up with. The the Zohar in uh, in the beginning in the beginning of Parshas Noach Tachazei, come and see. This is on Daf uh, Nun 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 Tes Nun Tes Amud Beis. Tachazei, Kegavna Da Noach Letata Kaima Kadisha Have Kedugma De Leela. Noach, the lower Noach, meaning Noach the man. He stood in a form in, in a in a in a in a formation akin to the Noah above. Okay, while da ikra isha adama, that's why Noah was called the man of the earth, isha adama, as he's called in the end of the parsha. Isha adama, meaning what? Meaning there's an archetypical spiritual Noah that is up above, and Noah down below is forming the. The, the, the parallel to this up above. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Gemara and Tanis that says that there is some type of supernal Yerushalayim Shalmala and there is Yerushalayim Shalmata. And God says that as long as the Yerushalayim Shalmata, the lower Yerushalayim, the physical embodied Yerushalayim, 
does not reflect the Yerushalayim Shalmala, there's more work to do. Meaning, there's an ideal. There's an ideal. And that, that ideal is called Yerushalayim Shalmala, the upper Yerushalayim. And the lower Yerushalayim needs to embody that. It needs to embody that ideal. Viraza Olifna, and we learn from this a secret, says the Zara. Daha Noach Itzrich Leteva Li Ischabraba, Ulakaima Zara Dehula. This is why Noah he builds an ark in order to make a remnant for mankind in the world. Now, we're not going to read the entire section of the Zohar because it's quite lengthy, but the point that the Zohar is trying to bring about is, is that the righteousness of Noah was in order to make a remnant for mankind. I.e., again, to broaden this theme to, to, a, more, to, a, more, to a more general idea. Noah sees that there is trouble facing humanity. There's, there's, there's trouble. There's trouble that's having concrete world consequences. And Noah wants to create a solution to, this, to, these, to, these, to these problems. And the first solution that Noah comes up with is the plow and all the farm tools, which solves the problem, so to speak, of the cursed earth. And the pinnacle of Noah's career, what's the, thing, what's the other thing that he invents to solve a problem? The teva. No, sorry. It's true. It's true. It's true. But, uh, yes, God. God does command him to do it. But it's just it's just pointing out that in the same way that Noah saw a problem in the beginning of his lifetime and invented a tool to overcome the problem. Okay, this is what Noah is doing his whole life. Noah is the person who invents farm tools. If you want a tool to make sure that that right, right that your crops grow well, this is this is. This is Noach. Noach's your guy. He's inventing things to solve problems. And the pinnacle of Noach's life is that he invents something to solve a super big problem. And what's the thing that he makes in order to, to solve the super big problem? He builds the teva in order to save mankind. This is the thing that characterizes Noach's tzidkus, Noach's righteousness. Now, there's a very big problem with this, Rabbi What's the fundamental problem with this? The problem is, is that does Noah solve the problem that Lemech describes, Lemech his father, when he names him? Lemech says, this one is going to console us from the cursed earth, from the, from the, from the earth that God cursed, and from the sorrow of our hands. Does Noah solve the problem? It doesn't solve the problem. Because what's the problem? What's the problem? At root, at root, what's the problem? Sin sin has caused the world to be... The fact that the earth is cursed, that's the root of the problem. The fact that the earth was cursed because of Adam's sin, that is the problem. And what is Noah's approach in order to solve this problem? I'll invent a machine that can circumvent the problem. That's Noah's approach. And indeed, this comes to a head as Noah progresses in his career, so to speak, when he reaches... You know, his, right, the prime time for Noah to shine, when the Mabel is going to come and destroy all of mankind, God comes to him and says, listen, I've decided that I'm going to destroy the world because the world has become irredeemably corrupt. Every, all flesh has become completely corrupt and we need to do away with them. So I need you to make a big boat. And this is how you're going to make it. It's going to be 300 almost long and it's going to be 50 wide and 30 tall. And Noah says, great, I'm on it. <laughs> is Noah solving the problem that God just put in front of him? He's not. He's not solving the problem that God put in front of him. He's, re, he's, he's using the same, the same approach that he made from the outset. He's, 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 he's now just doing it at a bigger scale. Okay, for, first people were having trouble farming, so I'll invent tools for that. Now the world's going to be destroyed, so I'll make a big boat, and that will save everyone. Noah is continuing in this path, in this path of, he's not addressing the problem. He's circumventing the problem. Now, as Moshe Tzvi just pointed out a moment ago, well, didn't God command him to build the boat in this way? That's true. That's true. However, however, this this is this is this is underscoring the point even more. We'll just we'll just read this with we'll just read the section from the Zohar. This is in the Zohar Chadosh, in Daf Chavtes Amud Beis. Excuse me, Chavtes Amud Aleph. Excuse me, Chavtes Amud Aleph. Tonu Rabbanon, Ma Heshev Hakadosh Baruch Hu Lenoach Keshiyata Min Ateva. 
Noach comes and he sees, he opens the, he opens the ark, okay? The hine charva ha'aretz. What does that mean, hine charva ha'aretz? Just the pshat, just the pshat of the words. What is the word, what does that mean? Hine charva ha'aretz. Oh, so in context, it could mean two things. Charva, as the word was used before, asher al pene kol ha'charava mesu, that which was, that which, that which was on the charava died because of the mabul. So the charava means dry land. Charava is dry. Okay? And now when, when, when Noah comes out of the teva after the, after the flood has dissipated, so it says charva ha'aretz, that the land was dry. However, as was just pointed out, charva has another, has another connotation, which means destroyed. And indeed, it was destroyed. Everything was destroyed. The only extent of the world that was left, that had survived, was in this ark. That was it. Noah comes out and he sees that the whole world has been destroyed. Destroyed. I'm reading from the Zohar. He sees the whole world has been destroyed. And Noah starts crying over the destroyed world. And he says, God, creator of the world, you were called the merciful one. You should have had mercy on your creation. Hey, Shiva Kadosh Baruch Hu, God answered him the following, Raya Shatya, you foolish shepherd. Kan Amart Da, now you're saying this? And not at the time that I told you, in a soft voice, in a soft voice. When I told you that I was going to destroy all of mankind, you didn't think of this? You didn't think of this problem before? Etc. I meant, I let all this time go by, because as we know, it took a very, very long time to build the ark. The Seder Olam says it took 120 years to build the ark, which is, you know, reasonable considering their limitations. When you thought that you and your family would be saved in the ark, lo al balibach bishusa de alma. You did not consider the wickedness of the world. And you made your ark and you were saved. Now that the world has been lost. Oh, you open your mouth to give, right, to beseech me in prayer? When Noach saw this, when Noach saw that when he, when he came to this realization that he had made this mistake, he kriv alavan the karbanin. He started to bring sacrifices as an atonement on himself. And he brought up sacrifices on the altar. These these olos, excuse me, these olos and karbanos that Noah brought was a was a form of kapara for himself, a kapara to, in order to atone for this attitude that he had. In order to this approach that he's had, the approach that he's had his whole life of looking at the problem, and he Noah desperately wants to find a solution to the problems that he sees in the world, and that's why he's called a tzaddik. He's called a tzaddik because he really sincerely wants to find problems to the to, excuse me solutions to the problems that mankind is facing, and he that's why he's called a tzaddik. However, from the other perspective, he's only a tzaddik bedor asav. He's only righteous vis-a-vis his own generation. Because he doesn't bother to, he can't, he can't. He seems he's not, he seems he's not capable in some sense of being able to go to the root of the problem. Noah is not going to be a spiritual revolutionary. He's not going to go around and try to, try to rally people to tshuva. And if he does, it's not, it's not effective. And, and to be, to be perfectly honest, the Torah seems to be very clear about the tragic nature of Noah, that Noah goes off the scene he 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 basically fall, falls falls off the scene in a tragic end. His his own son betrays him. He has to be right. He has to and his other two sons take pity on him. And Noach is basically off the stage. That's it. He lives another you know several hundred years, but he's off the stage. And this is the tragedy of Noach. The tragedy of Noach is that Noach he realizes the shortcomings of his approach. The shortcomings of his approach is is that you cannot save the world by inventing gadgets to circumvent the problem. You could be, you could have the most creative approach, you could have the most 
brilliant innovations, you're not going to save the world through making smart gadgets. It's not going to work. And Noah realizes this, and it and it and it and it and it destroys him. It destroys him. The uh, Chazal say in Bracious Rabbah, Vayachel Noach Ish Ha'adama. After the after the flood, and after God gives him the covenant that he would never destroy the earth again, it says that Noach, the man of the of the earth, began began. He began his career again as the as the as the man of the earth. Says the Midrash Rabbah, and Rashi brings us on the on the on the, on, on on this pasuk. Nischalel venase chulen. The word vayachel means to begin, but it also has the connotation of nase chulen. He became chulen again. What does this mean? He became chulen because he goes immediately. He returns to what he's to what he's good at. He returns to being an isha adama, a man of the field. He goes back to inventing farm tools because that's all he can do. That's a, that that. That's that's the he just received a covenant from God that he is able to bring in some type of a spiritual revolution to mankind, something, a framework, a spiritual framework that will give people the moral and ethical something, substrate, to be able to continue to have the to have to have mankind continue. And then right after that, most, he Noach goes back to back to the farm tool paradigm. Bayachel, na sechulin. Na sechulin. And it's just as a note, before we before we before we leave the Noah story, in no way is this a is this a criticism of Noah in the ultimate sense. Right? This is a person who he he clearly wasn't wasn't he didn't he didn't have he didn't have the capability of right of bringing about some type of massive transformation of mankind. He was devoted for his entire life to trying to do the best that he could. And the trauma of seeing the entire world destroyed and all he could do was save eight human beings. That was it. That's all he could do. That, uh, that uh, we can't imagine such a, such, a, such a tragedy that could befall such a person. But be that as it may, Noah is off the scene. He's off the scene. So, the next part of this transition, of this story, is obviously the story of the Dora Paloga, the tower. Now, <laughs> what's fascinating about the tower story is that how 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 long how long is the story in the Torah? What? How many? What? It depends on from. The most the most liberal definition that you could give. <laughs> the story in the Torah is nine psukim long. It's nine psukim long. Okay, and this is a story that it's it it just it just it just begs some type of explanation, something to the point that Chazal, Chazal say in the Midrash Rabbah, Chet Dor Hamabul Nisparsha. The sin of the generation of the flood was made explicit. It says, Ki aretz that everyone wa- resorted to this aggressive thievery and violence. That was basically, right, the, the specifics, any more details, it doesn't say, but it was something involving that, that, that area of sin. The sin of, the, of, the, of that generation was not made explicit. Chazal even say, it's very difficult to understand. What exactly went on with the Dura Palaga? What exactly was the root of their sin? So this is where it gets a bit dark. Okay, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just warning everyone. Not, not like I suspected that anyone here is squeamish, but just, just, uh, just an introduction. This is where it gets dark. Where's the Yushalmi? So, how does the story start off? The story starts off with emphasizing where these people were that they decided they're going to make this transition into some type of unified, homogenous society where Dvarim Achadim, it says that they all travel to Eretz Shin'ar. They all travel to this place called Shin'ar. Okay, now Shin'ar is the area that is known, that was known even, even till relatively modern times, in, in the area of Mesopotamia. Let's say Iraq, and uh, yeah, it's basically Iraq. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, it's not the, it's not the Fertile Crescent. Fertile Crescent is where we are. We're in the Fertile Crescent. 
Where are the Fertile Crescent? The, the, the Shinar is Shinar is east of the Fertile Crescent. But even the Rambam, even the Rambam throughout the throughout the Mishnah Torah talks about Eretz Shinar that it's the custom in Eretz Shinar to do X, Y, and Z. Right? In the few times that he refers to customs, Shinar. Okay, so says the says the Yerushalmi Brachos. This is not a particularly long thing. Lama Nikra Eretz Shinar. What what's the meaning of this word Shinar? Says the Yerushalmi in Perak Al in Perak Al Mishnah Dalid, Sheshama Nina Aru Mese Hamabul. This was a ge- geological basin. It was a valley, and all of the dead from the Mabul collected there. You can imagine it's like a bathtub. I mean, it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty eerie um, muscle to describe to use to describe this. But you know, you know, you know, if you let out the water from a huge basin. Then all everything that's all the objects that are in this basin are going to collect onto the lowest point. So all of the dead from the Mabul collected in this place called Shinar. Okay? That's why this place is called Shinar. And the Torah makes a point of saying that this was the that this 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 was the place where they decided to set this up, to set up this tower society. Al-Kidekach that the Gemara in Shabbos says, the Gemara in Shabbos, in Daf Kuf Yud Gimel, Amit Beis, the Bavli in Shabbos, Kol Ha'ochel Me'ofro Shel Shinar, anyone that eats from the dust of Shinar, Kilo Ochel Mi Besar Avosav, he's eating the flesh of his ancestors. It's pretty... <laughs> There are so many, so many victims of the flood collected in this place that it's basically all human bodies. That's, bas- that's basically what it's saying. So they're in this emek that's full of the dead. That's full of the dead bodies. Okay, from from the from the from the marble. And to just to just to highlight, just to end off at this point, okay, to, not to think that this is uh, this 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 is not some 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 type of some type of mystical story. This is seen in the eyes of the Masora as what what actually took place. The Gemara in Brachos in the in the in the, in the eighth parak where it's listing the different brachos that people say when they come to different places or see different phenomenon. It says, uh, You come to a place, okay, that from there they took Afar in Bava. There's a certain place that they would take Afar, okay? We'll explain in a minute. Or we'll see Rashi in a minute. If you come to this place, what bracha do you make? Boruch gozer umekayem. Blessed is the one who he decrees upon the wicked and he fulfills the thing that he decreed upon them. That's what the Gemara says. Okay? Says Rashi, Mokom shenot lemimenu afar. Says Rashi, Ubi esod morenu verabeinu harav Yitzchak. It could be that he's referring to his father, but I'm not sure. Raisi shenot lemisham afar letit lebinyanim. This is a place known in Shinar that they took from this place mud in order to make bricks. The sof sof osomakom ein bo yishu velo zara velo netia, and this place is completely it's it, 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 people can't live there basically. It's 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 uh, it's uninhabitable. The person comes to this place. This is the blessing that they make. Where is this place exactly? We don't know, but there is such a place. The place in Eretz Shinar that everyone knows that they took bricks from there and they made right. They made they made. Excuse me, they took the mud and they took the dirt from this place, they made bricks. You come to this place, you make the blessing. Blessed is God who sees evil, he decrees upon it, and he fulfills his decree. The hate of the, uh, the just 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 before we get to the to the to the right, to the broader implications of the hate. The project of building the tower of Osai was that all of mankind, at least the mankind that was living in that area. They decided they were going to come to Shinar, the place where all of the bodies from the flood had collected, and they were going to build a tower from the victims of the flood. That's what they were going to do. They were going to build a tower out of the flood victims. Now you would say, that's pretty strange. Why would you want to do... First of all, that's very... Right? I mean, you could imagine a, a tower with the... You know, but. <laughs> But but why why would you do that? Why why would you want to build a tower out of the victims of the flood? So the Pirkei Rabbi Lazar 
and we're gonna go. We're gonna we're gonna reference the Pirkei Avi Lezer a lot during this uh, during the series because it gives a lot, gives a tremendous amount of insight into what exactly is going on here. Says the Pirkei Avi Lezer. This is in Parakud Aleph. Asara Malachim Molchu Bechol Haolam Kula. There were ten kings that they ruled over the entire earth. Okay, Harishon. The first one is God. God created the world, and he he ruled over everything because he created everything. He was clearly the king. Okay, Hasheni, the second king. Who's the second king? Zen Nimrod. Nimrod was the second king. Shahayu Habrios Yireim Mime Hamabul. Because all of mankind feared the flood, umolchu oso aleim, and they made him king over them. Nimrod is instrumental, as we will soon see, in bringing about this tower project. He's the king. He's the king of Shinar, as it says in Parshas Noach. He's the king of Shinar, this place that they're building the tower. And the way that he was able to position himself as the king is because the, all of mankind was petrified from the mabul. Okay, what does that mean that they were petrified from the mabul, and therefore, and that's the leverage that Nimrod had over them in order to notice so that they would make him king? It says in Midrash Rabbah, this is Midrash Rabbah and Parshas Noach, Simon, uh, Simon Lamedches, excuse me, Parshal Lamedches, Simon, uh, Simon Vav. Udvarim achadim, describing the state of mankind when they come to Shinar. They come to Shinar, udvarim achadim, and everything, everything seem, has this connotation of oneness, everyone's together, or something like that. Udvarim achadim. Says the Midrash, udvarim achadim, dibru dvarim chadim. They spoke sharp things. What were the sharp things that they said? Excuse me, just uh, looking for the uh, the simon. Hear it. Omru, they said, that the generation said the following. Achas le'elef u'shmonim o'shana. Once every 1,800 years. Nismotatu ha'shomayim. The heavens become unstable. Bo v'nase migdal. Let us come and build a tower. Uniyatsev or so, and we will and we will stabilize the heavens. We'll stabilize the heavens with this migdal. This is the leverage that Nimrod uses to position himself as king. This is what the this is what the Pirkei says that all of mankind feared the Mabul and made Nimrod king. What do the people say? They say, "Listen, you know the Mabul that we experienced a few years back. Remember, everyone everyone remembers that." Well, the reason for that is, is because once in a while, once every 1,800 years or so, the heavens become unstable. The heavens become unstable. So let's build this massive tower. Let's build this massive tower. And uh, we'll stabilize the heavens. This is why you build the tower out of the victims of the flood. Because if you want to build a project that everyone is on board and realizes the seriousness of what's going on, in order to force people to come and participate in this tower, you build it out of the victims of the thing that you're trying to prevent. This is why they decide to go to Shinar and build the, the, build the building out of the very victims of the flood, because the purpose of the tower was to prevent the next flood. This is the motivator, and this is the, this is the tzayid, the hunter, right? The hunter ensnarement, as the Pasuk says, the tzayid, Gibor tzayid, he ensnared, he ensnared the people. What did he do? He said, listen, we need to have a project in order to save mankind because once every 1,000 some odd years, there's going to be a massive mobile and we need to be ready. So let's build a massive tower and I'll arrange everything. This is, this is, the, this is the fear that Nimrod leverages mankind in order, to build about, in order to bring about this tower. And they are literally building this tower out of the victims of the last catastrophe that they are trying to prevent. Now, both sides, do you see a pattern over here? What's the problem with this statement? What's the problem with this? What, what, what's the problem at the root? That they're looking at the mabul and they say, you know what? The mabul is because once in a while the heavens become unstable, so we'll build a massive tower and we'll prevent the next mabul from happening. Do you see how this is a metastasizing of the original 
Kilkul, the original perversion of Noach's attitude towards the world. Noach looked at the world and he sees problems and he says, you know what, I have to think of practical solutions to the problem. But he doesn't address the spiritual root that undergirds the problem to begin with. The Dora Palaga, they go a step further. They pretend like there is no spiritual basis for anything that's going wrong. There's no moral or spiritual basis for anything that's going on. The Mabu, it's just a, right? there's, a, there's, a, there's an indifferent clockwork universe that once in a while there's, there's big tragedies. And what are you going to do? Okay, so let's figure out a way, a practical way to address the problem of the Mabu. And what's that practical problem going to be? Excuse me, what's that practical solution going to be? A huge giant tower that's going to stabilize the heavens. For both sides, the, as this tower gets bigger and bigger, right? I'm reading, I'm reading again from Bukhar Rabbi Elezer, this time from Perak Chavdalit. They would burn bricks, and, right, they would, excuse me, they would fashion bricks and then burn them. Until the tower was 70 mil high, which is very high. And how did they get the bricks up to the top? There was a ramp, there was a ramp from the east and a ramp from the west. They would go up. They would go up from the east side. They would show you yard them, and then they would come back down to get more bricks. They would come back. They would come back down the Maravo from the west. The im nafal adam v'meis lo hayu samimis libam alav. If a guy would fall off of this massive ramp and die, no one would pay attention. The im nafla levena achas. But if one brick would fall off the ramp as it was going up, hayu yoshvin ubochin. They would all sit down and cry. Quick. Come and bring a replacement for the broken brick. This is what this is the this is ha- the devolution of what happens when a when 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 the individual and the collective begin to look at the world through this lens. There is no moral, ethical, spiritual underpinnings to anything that's going on. This is a completely indifferent world. Problems come up once in a while, and this is what you got to do. You got to figure out. You, you just got to. You just got to look for problems and finding the solution to the problem. Finding the practical solution to the problem is the absolute most important thing. And we're going to build this tower out of the bodies of the last of the last catastrophe, so that you all freak out and you all be terrified, so that you won't lose focus over this project. And that's what it's going to be. And eventually, everyone loses they, their their priorities. Go completely out of whack. Completely, completely out of whack. Where's the Rambam? The Rambam in Hilchos Tanis. This is an incredibly powerful line. At the end of Hilchos Tanis, excuse me, at the end of Perak Aleph of Hilchos Tanis. Worth uh, reading inside. I apologize. It's in uh, in Perak uh, Perak Aleph Hilchos Tanis Halacha Gimel. The Dover Zemi Darke Atshuva. This is this is the way of 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 repentance. Shebizman Shatavut Sara. That a time when 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 the when the community is experiencing some calamity, the Izaku Elea. Oleha, and they cry out to God over it. The Edu, and they know Hakol Shabiglal Maasem Haroyim Horolahem. And they come to the realization that whatever is befalling them is because of their wicked deeds. Everything that everything that's befalling them is in some way connected to them. In some way, it's connected to something that they did. And this is the way that people will come to change their ways and remove the calamity from them. Aval im lo yizaku v'lo yariu. But if they do not cry out, and they do not assemble a public fast day in order to assess their ways and improve what's going on, el yamu davar ze mi min hag haolam iralanu. This is just happenstance. This is the way of the world. This is the way things are. Fitzarazu nikra nikrais. It's just it happened to be. It's a coincidence that this happened to be. This plague, this locust, this famine. It just it just happened to be. Harezu derech achzarius. 
This unbelievable thing that this is the way of the cruel. The cruel. We think the opposite. We think on the surface level is opposite. If you come to someone and you say, you know what, it's your fault that this happened. Obviously, there's a nice way and a not nice way to say it. But, but, but in the end of the day, we think you come to someone and say, you know why you're experiencing the suffering? Because it's your fault. Because you did X, Y, and Z. We think that's cruel. And if someone says, listen, tragedy happens. Tragedy happens. That's, that's being nice. Says the Rambam, no, it's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite. Because if you come to someone and say, you know what? Sometimes things ha- some, some, Sometimes tragedy happens, but you have nothing to do with it. If you come to someone and say, you are actually empowered to be able to improve the situation. Your actions have a direct effect on what goes on in the world. That is empowerment. That's, that's, that, that's, 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 that's real kindness to be able to say that. But someone who chooses this path of saying that suffering in the world is just, it's just, it's just a mikra. It's just a coincidence. The gorem aslehem li dovek b'maaseim harayim betosef hatsara tsaros acheros. And eventually more calamities will be added to this calamity. This is the derech of the Dora Palaga. The Dora Palaga saw, they saw the world in this way. It's a coincidence. The model was a coincidence. It happens. Once in a while it happens. Okay. So what are we going to do? We'll build a, we'll build a tower to, to make sure that the, next time around it won't be so bad. This leads to achzarius. This leads to cruelty. And we see, this is what happens. Their priorities become so off kilter that when people are literally falling to their deaths from this 70 mile high tower, that doesn't bother them at all. But when, the, when, a, when a brick falls down and smashes into a million pieces, that's a national catastrophe. This is how Achzarius happens. This is how Achzarius is created. Achzarius is created from this perspective, from the perspective of the world as there are problems that are happenstance that we have to figure out solutions to the problem. There's no, there's nothing existential, moral, ethical, nothing that undergirds us. And this is the this is the this is the this is the deterioration, the deterioration of mankind. We're already going uh, over an hour over here, so I'll try to I'll try to wrap up. I would just really like to get into into how Avraham falls into this into this whole narrative. Since this week we're starting to learn about Avraham. Yes. You said that by, by, by a brick they would, they would, they would cry. So you would. It seems like they shouldn't, they shouldn't be crying about that also. You know, what, why were they crying about that? Because for them, the most important thing was building the tower. So if the means to building the tower if, are destroyed, then that's, uh, that's like the worst thing that could possibly happen. Meanwhile, ostensibly, why are they building the tower? To save mankind. So if some, but, but some guy just died, isn't that a... No, no, I need to build the tower. You see, the, the, it, it, it warps the thinking. Yeah. Oh, that was that's that's a that's from the Pirkei Dabi Lezer in Perakov Dal. So, to segue now into Avram Avinu. Now it's important just to highlight over here. What exactly was going on with mankind at this time? We see already in Parshas Bereshis, in Parak Dalad, Pasak Chavav, that Enosh, who is the great-grandson of Adam Arishon, it says that something unique happens in the time of Enosh. Oz hu chal likro b'shem Hashem. It was at that time that they began to call out in the name of God. Now what does that mean, that they started to call out in the name of God? So says Rashi, Oz hu chal likro b'shem alokus, alohus rather. They, 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 they referred to things in divine terms. The nasa mimenu avodas giludin. They would refer to natural phenomenon in the world, even objects, whether it was the weather, whether it was the sun or the moon or whatever, and they, and they imbued it with divine qualities. Hu chal likro b'shem Hashem. They started to call out in the name of God. This is what happens in the time of Enosh. Meaning, meaning what? This is the beginnings of idolatry. The beginnings of idolatry happen in Enosh. As the Rambam said, I keep on getting calls at 11.30 at night, that's very strange. The, 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 the Rambam lays this out uh, quite nicely in the first parak of Hilchas HaVod It's worth going through this entire parak. It's not so long. It's three halachos long, basically. But we'll cover the excerpts that are relevant to us. 
Says the Rambam in Perak Aleph of Hilchos Avodas Gilulim. Bine Enosh, in the days of Enosh, To Bine Adam Tos Gedola. All of mankind made a tremendous error. The Enosh Atzma Minatoim. Enosh himself, the great grandson of Adam, was amongst these was amongst these people who went off the path. V'zuhai Sefer Usam Amru Hoyel V'ha'el Barak Ochavim V'gal Galim L'hanegas Olam. Because God created all these natural phenomenon to run the world. And gave them tremendous honor in this way. It's appropriate for us to also give them honor. It's appropriate for us to give them honor. In order to give honor and stature to that to, to those who he gave honor to. Meaning just like a king, if a king appoints a, a, right, appoints a, appoints an official. To his court, so you have to give honor to the official because he's the king's official. So, so too we should give honor to the sun and the moon and the stars and all the other celestial bodies because this is what God has appointed in order to in order to run the world. Once this thought, once this 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 thought pattern came onto their hearts, he schilu livnos the kochavim hechalos ulahakrib lahem karbonos ulashabcham lufaram. They started to build temples and altars to these to these to these entities and to give praise to them and to offer them sacrifices. I'm skipping to uh, to Halacha Beis. And as the as time progressed, Amdu b'nei Adam neviyeh sheker, va'amru shahel sivah lahem, va'amru lahem ibdu kochav ploni. It started to become systematized. It wasn't just this organic. <laughs> this organic pagan impetus of let's uh, you know let's give honor to let's give honor to nature and you know and right and pray to it and uh, sacrifice to it etc. Is they started to become prophets and the prophets started to man the temples and they started to make a whole uh, a whole religion out of it. The name of God was forgotten from all of the world. All people knew were these graven images and these pagan temples that they knew from when they were from when they were young. Until the pillar of the world was born, Shehu Avram Avinu. When this giant, meaning Avraham, came of age, he started investigating with his mind. He started to think about the nature of the world and the fundamental assertions of these pagan systems. During this whole time, Avraham was a practicing pagan, a practicing idolater. And at some point, Yoda Shakol Ha'am Toim. He came to the realization that the entire nation was that 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 the that the entire people in which he lived amongst, they were all wrong. They were all mistaken. He would start to make a public spectacle out of this. He would start to have debates with people in the street. He would start to challenge the wise men of Ur Kasdim. He would challenge them on the truth of their asser- of their assertions. And he would start to, to make a protest out of this. He would take idols into the street and smash them. Things got very intense. Avraham was gathering followers. People were, people, people were being persuaded by Avraham's arguments. The king decided he was going to kill him. The king. The king decided he was going to kill him. And there was a miracle performed for him, and he went and he left and he was able to escape to Haran. And he was able to gather alafim v'revavos ad eretz kenan. Avraham Avinu had a movement going on, which started in the streets of Ur Kasdim with these debates, with these public debates, with the with the with the with the with the with the, with the pagan priests 
and eventually ended up with this movement of Alafim the Revavos. The Rambam is not one to, uh, to make exaggerations. Thousands of people were following Avram Avinu into Canaan. A note that, I, that, I, that I'm, just, I'm just remembering right now. A Chazal say in the Gemara and Abad Azara, following up on a Gemara in Sanhedrin, the Gemara in Sanhedrin says, Shis alfi shnin that the, that the world, world history is divided into, right, into 6,000 years. 2,000 years of Tohu, of chaos, 2,000 years of Torah, and 2,000 years of Mashiach. Ask the Gemara, and, right, this is the Gemara in Abad Azara. When do the 2,000 years of Torah begin? When does the 2,000 years of Torah begin? Amen. What's the Pasuk? The Pasuk that the Gavran of Arazara begins, brings. A Pasuk from this week's parasha. The Eshanefesh Asher Osu Becharo. The souls that Avraham and Sarah created in Haran. Who are these souls? These are the, this is the Avraham and Sarah movement. It's not just Avraham and Sarah and their immediate family or their servants or whatever. This is a massive movement that comes with them from Shinar all the way to Eretz Yisrael. And if you, just, if you could just imagine a map, this is like a rough map over here. If Or Kasdim is over here, at, you know, in southeast Iraq, okay, and here is Eretz Yisrael, you can't really cut across straight because this is the Arabian Desert and you can't walk through. So Avram goes... There's, there's, there's just no, there was no a few settlements there. If you wanted, like, if you wanted food and stuff on the exactly. way, you, have to go, you, you have can't, to go right. you can't, you can't Euphrates, walk through there. Correct. The Euphrates, like the river, Correct. And to this river. day, you can't really... The prince of Saudi Arabia is trying to build a yeah, massive yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, glass city in the middle of nowhere, which, uh, okay, <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen, but, uh, but uh, there was no massive glass city at the time. You couldn't walk from Ur Kasdim that's over here straight into Eretz Yisrael, which is over here. So you have to go all the way up through Iraq into what's today Syria, and then come down into, come down into Eretz Yisrael. Okay? So he, as he's going on this journey, he's, bring, he's bringing people with him. He says, oh, this is the, this, the, that's that Avram guy that challenged Nimrod and made the whole uh, spectacle of the street and was smashing the idols. He's, this, is a, this, is a, this is a movement now. It's a massive movement. To, uh, to, uh, to, just, to just give the imagery of, like what, of, what, of, what, of what exactly began in Ur Kasdim and ended up with Avram coming into the land of Israel with this movement of thousands of people. We... Uh, we were describing how you know people would go up the tower, bring up the bricks. People would fall down to their death. No one would care. <laughs> but when the bricks would fall, everyone would freak out. The Ovar Avram ben Terach. Avram ben Terach passes by this scene of the people falling to their deaths off this massive tower. The Ra'al some bonim esair ve'esamigdal, and he sees them building the city and the tower. The kilalam the shame Elohav, and he curses them with the name of his God. The Amar Bola Hashem Palag Lishonam. God will consume you and split open your tongue. Your tongue meaning your speech, which is indeed what happened to them. That's from Tehillim Nunhei. This was the curse that Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu's object, his whole protest had an ideological and a social, let's say, element to it. Because he sees the dystopia of the tower. He sees what's going on. He sees, guys, do you realize what's going on? People are literally dying in the streets because of this tower project. And this is okay with you? And you're, and you're, right, and you're mourning over the bricks? And Avram realizes this is all embedded in the idolatrous worldview of the culture in which he lives. This is all being orchestrated by the Nimrod. By the Nimrod that capitalized on the fear of mankind over the Mabul and builds this dystopian society that is idolatrous in its ideology and completely dystopian in its orientation. Chazal say in the Gemara in Erevin, again, just moving a little bit forward into the parasha. We learn in the middle of the parasha, some, it just it seemingly comes out of left field. Avraham comes into the land, and he stops in a few places, and then, out of the blue, Vayhi Am Rafael, it was in the days of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, who had three other friends who were also kings in the area. And they had vassal states in the, in the area of Canaan. And at some point, these vassal states in Canaan rebelled against them. So the next year, the year after the rebellion, what happened? Amraphel and his friends, they all get together and they invade Canaan and there's a massive war. 
So you might think, okay, it, it hap- I guess it just happened to be that Avram found himself in the middle of this massive war and he has to go rescue his nephew and he also gets uh, involved in the fighting a little bit. No, 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 Rabosa. No, no, no. This is not what's going on. This war, Amrafaihibi me Amrafel, say Chazal, Chazal in the Gemara in the Darim, in excuse me, in Erevin. The Gemara in Erevin and Daf Nun Gimel. Nun Gimel Amad Aleph. Amr Shmuel, Vaihibi me Amrafel. Amr Shmuel, Nimrod Shemo. His real name was Nimrod. Meaning, this is Nimrod. Amraphel is Nimrod. The Lama Nikra Shemo Amraphel. Why was he called Amraphel? Shehipil Avraham Lakivshan Haesh. Because he's the one that threw Shehipil Amraphel. Amraphel, Hipil Avraham. He's the guy that threw Avraham into the Kivshan Haesh. Now, Rabosai, if you want to execute someone who's, a, you know, who's, uh, who's, who's, who's causing you trouble, you know, throwing him into a throwing him into a fiery furnace seems like a little bit of overkill. That first of all, and second of all, who has a fiery furnace that they just have sitting around David. to execute people in? David. Right? David. What is the what is the kivshon haesh that Nimrod throws Avraham into? It's the kivshon that they're using to build the bricks. That's why he has the kivshon haesh. He says, "Oh, you're you're protesting the bricks. You're protesting our 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 brick project." Yala, into the into the into the furnace with you. Into the kivshon, the kivshon for the bricks. Now what happens with Avraham? As the Ramba makes clear, as Avraham is growing in popularity, this is not just an ideological contest. This is not just like a you know, you know, a, a high school debate team, you know, who's right? Is the monotheist right or is the or are the pagans right? No. This has major, major implications for the stability of the whole society. Of Nimrod, who the Gemara, who as we saw in the Pirkei Lezer, Nimrod stole Malchus Shamayim, as it were, because of his ability to leverage mankind and instill fear and and right and 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 and, and an idolatrous worldview into mankind. This Avraham character is a threat. He's a real threat, and Nimrod tries to tries to take care of him unsuccessfully, and Avraham escapes. He escapes. He escapes to Haran, which, by the way, Haran, which is a, a talk for a different time, but. Charon was basically like the New York City, and I say that literally. I'm saying that accurately. It was, it was, it was the, it was the, it was the liberal, open, metropolitan center of the ancient world, which is why, by the way, Nachor, the right, the, the right, the grandfather of uh, of, uh, of Rivka and Lavan goes there because Nachor, right, the brother of Avram, he also wants to be able to contribute to the Avram Avinu project, but he has a different path. He says, you know, I'm going to go to the center of the action. I'm going, to go, right, I'm going to go set myself up on the middle of Fifth Avenue and I'm going to preach to the passers-by. That's what I'm going to do. Charon is the, right, it's this, it's, this, right, it's this booming liberal metropolis of the ancient world. Anyway, Avram escapes, escapes there. And on the way, he's, 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 he's developing a movement. He has a movement. And where does he decide to settle? Where does he decide to settle? In Canaan, in the middle of the vassal states of Nimrod and his Hevra back in Shinar. Now, this, this, this makes it even worse. <laughs> right? When Avram was just a lone guy in the streets uh, speaking crazy, okay, so fine, you know. Okay, I tried to kill him, it didn't work out. Right? right he's out of my hair. But now it's even worse because now Avram has a movement in Canaan. It's in the middle of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the states that they control. These, right, these, right, these vassal states that they control. And this is why the Shlosh excuse me, Shana Maradu, in the 12th year, they rebel. Why do they rebel? Why do they? Why do they suddenly want to rebel after twelve years of being servants to the right to the kings of Mesopotamia? Why do they rebel? They rebel because they see that there is a shift now. There is this movement that the the kings of Shinar couldn't couldn't crush, couldn't take care of. This has major major repercussions for the whole region. The fact that Avram is moving in, moving in and disrupting everything. Where Rabos I do? Just one second. I'll promise I'll get to you. Where do where does Avraham meet up with the king of Sodom and the other refugees from the initial clash between the four and five kings? El Emek Shavei, who Emek Hamelech. Rashi brings us already. This is a Yalkut Shimoni. But Rashi already brings us. Why is this called Emek Hamelech? Why is that place called Emek Hamelech? 
because all of the kings of the region came together there, and they made Avraham their king. This is what it means. And we see this, we're going to see this in two weeks from now in Parshas Chayesara when he comes to buy a plot of land in Hebron and the people of the place say, of course we'll give you a plot of land. You're a prince of God amongst us. Of course we'll give you whatever you ask for. Avram is this very, very powerful, influential figure. So influential that his very that his coming into Canaan shakes up the entire dynamics of the region. And Nimrod and his Hevra back in Shinar must crush this movement. They must crush it. And Avram is forced to, right? He can't, he can't remain. He can't, he can't remain just, you know, an ideological revolutionary anymore. He needs to fight. Right? He comes, he, right? he takes all of his people together. The fact that he's able to assemble an army of 300 people on a moment's notice says something. Right? It says, it says, right? it says something. Just one more note, and I promise I'll get to everyone. Just one more note. The, the last Midrash Rabba that I wanted to quote. Midrash Rabba says on the Pasuk in Tehillim, Tehillim Kuflam uh, uh, Tehillim Aben Aleph. Niki chapayim uvar levav. The person who his hands are clean and his heart is pure. Says the Midrash, Ze Avraham. This is talking about Avraham. Niki chapayim midamo shall nimrod. Meaning what? Nimrod and Avraham, according to... They meet on the battlefield in... Emek Hamelech, or somewhere around, some, some, somewhere abouts, and Avram kills him. Avram kills Nimrod, which, by the way, gives a lot of insight. I say this parenthetically. It gives an insight into the significance of Malkit Zedek, who is shame coming out and greeting him afterwards. Why is that? Because Nimrod is the great grandson of shame. Nimrod is the great grandson of shame, and shame was the teacher of Avram. You can imagine the, the, the conundrum that Avraham is in. Avraham, right? Avraham has to kill the grandchild of his, of his teacher. And the fact that shame comes out and greets him and says, no, I, right, I make peace with you, I understand you, I had no choice, That's a, this is a, this is a, a significant event in that, uh, in that context. Yes, okay, I just, oh, there were some people that had uh, questions. Yeah. Why is, it, why is it a vow for the other day? It's not a vow between Avraham and who 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 is it who is it that they're trying to that they're trying to put down that the that the four kings from Shinar that the four kings from Mesopotamia who are they trying to put down they're trying the the five kings are the kings that rebel because of Avraham coming into the land and why do they go after Lot specifically in order to draw out Avraham in order to get him to join in order to get him to join the fight which he does. Yeah. The the people, um, the five kings, which which nations were they from? Because then there was there were two real like aside from there were two real, I don't know, I guess descendants of different people in in the, in the region at the time. There was the, the descendants of Canaan who kind of took to kind of like run the land, even though it seemed to be that you know, they, they were more not supposed to get land anyways because they were like slaves, yeah, according to Noah's curse. And then yeah. shame, shame, like the Eber, you know, they kind of crossed the river and went into the land. No, so, so which one? So which these people, they, who were they descendants of? Were they more like Eber, like Sashem, or more Kenan? Right, so, listen, the, the, in, in Parshas Noach, it says that the inhabitants of Kenan were all descendants of, of Ham at that time. However... The people of Eber, obviously, Shem, Shem was there, Eber was there. I mean, they, they, they said, Chazal, they made a yeshiva. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, they, 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 yeah, they, they, they were. And, and the idea of the calling them Eber, calling, calling, calling Eber is that they, they crossed the... the the on the other side of the river, like correct. The Euphrates is like the, 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 Listen, the, the, pa- the, the Pashtus. The Pashtus is that the vast majority of the inhabitants of the land were Canaanim, as it says explicitly in the pasuk. It says Va'Kanani Az Ba'aretz. It says this a few times during the lifetime of Avraham and Yitzchak that the Canaani was still in the land. Okay, so the so the vast majority of the inhabitants were Canaanim, but the but the but the point the point that I'm trying to highlight is is that when Avraham comes with his movement of as the Rambam says Ba'alafim Uravavos with thousands and tens of thousands. All following his, all 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 following him, who are loyal to him, loyal to him spiritually and militarily. Aner Eshkol and Mamre, the three famous friends of Avraham. Who are these guys? 
these are this is part of this movement. This is part of the Avra movement. Okay, so yes, it's true that most of them, most of the inhabitants of Canaan at the time were still were still uh, were still Canaanim. And we see in Parshas, I referenced Parshas Chayesara before that Avram approaches the 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 inhabitants of uh, Kiryas Arba who are all Bnei Ches. Bnei Ches being a tribe of right a tribe of Canaan. Yeah. So yes, the majority were Canaanim, but still there was a massive influx of Avram of Inu people into into so these five kings, into the, the land. These five kings, you talk, yeah, you descend of Canaan. It's not so. Again, the Pashas is yes, yes. The Pashas is yes. We don't know for sure, but the Pashas is yes. But but what I'm trying to say is that the reason that they that they feel that they felt prepared to rebel is because Avraham, who just rebelled against those kings, is now in the land with his tens of thousands of people. This also sheds light. This is also an important point. What once you understand the structure of these stories, that all the little details become clear. Just just to give, just give one example. People often ask, why is it that Avram is so so prepared to take money from Paro when he descends to Mitzrayim, but he has an issue taking from the riches of of uh, of Sodom when he right when he rescues all the people from Sodom. So the king of Sodom says, "Listen, you can take all the you can take all the possessions, but just give me back my people." And Avram says, "No, I would never take anything. I would never take any money from you. That you should say that I that I that I that I enriched Avram." People ask why? Why was he so willing to take from Paro? And, say, and so Paro could say, "I enriched Avram," but the king of Sodom couldn't, because the context of the, the context is completely different. That this 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 war that Avram is fighting is essentially a a a, a spiritual war. Avram understands exactly what's going on. This is an attempt to crush the Avram Avinu movement. And if Avram is going to be taking from the physical uh, 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 um, um, bounty of the war, so to speak. Is going to undermine the nature of the war, which is why, why, right? Where is this reflected in halacha? That when, when the Jewish people fight a malek, it's forbidden for them to, it's forbidden to take anything. Because the war is a spiritual war. This is not a war of conquest. They're not allowed to take anything. So when they actually fight a malek in the, right, in the generation of Shaul, they're not allowed to touch anything. And the next time they fight a malek in the time of Esther, right? They don't touch anything. Also, but, you don't touch anything. When the war is a spiritual war, you don't take anything. Huh? Nahon, Nahon, a similar idea. Similar idea. So, for both sides, we were able, we managed to fit everything into an hour and a half. I just, just to, just to end off with this, this last ta'ara, and then we'll, we'll right? we started. We said that Enosh, Enosh, this, the beginning of this idolatrous mindset, which started already in the time of Enosh, is described in the pasuk. That they began to call out in the name of God. And the Midrash Rabbah that we didn't quote. Excuse me. I, uh, I apologize. Amr Rebbe Simon. This is in, this is in, uh, this is in Parsha Chaf Gimel of Rashi's Rabbah. Vayachel Lashon Mered. Vayachel is the, right, is the word, right, is a term of Mered. We see, that they began to call out in the name of God. And the other, and the other example that they bring is Vayachel, um, um, right? Vayachel by Nimrod. That Nimrod began to rule. So just like the people, they right, who chal in the time of Enosh was a was a devolution for mankind. So so too it was the right, it was the right, that that continued in the time of Nimrod. But the point that I wanted to point out was this: Hu chal likro b'shem Hashem. They started to call out in the name of God. Where does that term appear again? Vikro b'shem Hashem by Avram. <laughs> Avram enters the land. The first thing that he does, Vikro b'shem Hashem, he builds him his back and he calls out the name of Hashem. But this calling out the name of Hashem is not like the Enosh calling out the name of Hashem. It's a completely different one, right? Whereas whereas Enosh was calling out the name of God in order to in order to idolatra, idolaterize their surroundings. The calling out in the name of Hashem of Avraham is in order to revert the focus back to its appropriate place, and this is the the literal revolution of Avraham Avinu, a revolution that was ideological, it was societal, and ended up being complete uh, a geopolitical upheaval in the entire area. We can understand the 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 impact the impact that Avraham has on his world. Not just for himself, but for for the entire for the entire area that he lived, and right, and 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 the and the and the and the and the course of events that he put into motion. Mizrach Hashem. Next week we will talk more about how this fits in with Sodom. What was really going on with Sodom? 
because it's not whatever it, 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 people, the Sodom story is, is a complete, complete, right, completely misunderstood. Sodom is a critical, vital point in understanding what, what is going on with the story, how this slides into the end of Avram Abinu's life with his purchasing of the Machpelah and his last interaction with the Bnei Ches. Bezrat Hashem, uh, the, last, uh, the last meeting will uh, revert all the way back to Maiseh Bereshus to see the real, real roots of this whole process and how Avram was essentially a correction for the Chet of Adam Arishon. Yishar Karach. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.